Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Grand Round Series. Uh, my name is Joe Saramelli, and I oversee Grand Rounds for our department. Uh, back in October, we shifted our Grand Round Series to this webinar format, and we've had presentations covering uh, uh, several different areas. Uh, I want to remind you, uh, as a participant, that going uh, the email announcements about Grand Rounds have a link for an evaluation. Uh, please consider filling that out after today's presentation. That's helpful for planning the series and for communicating with the presenter uh, afterwards. Uh, a, a point about today's presentation. Today's Grand Rounds presentation is sponsored by the Center for Mental Health Policy and the Law. Uh, and we heard about the new center back uh, in November uh, during a Grand Rounds presentation by Dr. Peel, who will introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Pinels. So I'll uh, stop uh, for now and turn it over to Dr. Peel. Thank you so much. Uh, as was just mentioned, I'm Jennifer Peel. I'm an associate professor in the department and the director. Uh, it's my great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Deborah Pinels. Dr. Pinels has an extensive and impressive resume, and I cannot do it justice in this short introduction. Among her clinical roles, she is the director of the program in psychiatry, law, and ethics, and a clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of Michigan School of Medicine. She is also the director of behavioral health and forensic programs for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. She is a past president of the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law, and she has held several leadership roles in other organized medical societies like the American Psychiatric Association. Dr. Pinels has a particular interest, and I'd say aptitude, in policymaking around issues in behavioral health and justice. On a more personal note, the presentation today is the first grand rounds sponsored by the new Center for Mental Health Policy and the Law more than a year ago, the center faculty started to think about who we would want to nominate for a grand rounds on a topic in forensic mental health. And Dr. Pinels went right to the top of the list. She is an accomplished and gifted clinician and educator, and she has worked on many important topics in forensics and community mental health. Some of her recent work has focused on competence to stand trial, which she will discuss today in her presentation on competence to stand trial and civil commitment. Are they related? So Dr. Pinels, we are so happy that you are joining, a, joining us today and we really look forward to your presentation. I'll turn it over to you. Great, and thank you so much, uh, Jennifer and the team for inviting me. It's really quite an honor to be here for your inaugural lecture. I'm really excited about your center and all of its potential. And I'm gonna launch right into my presentation and hope that we have time for discussion. I wanna start uh, by just, um, just letting people know that you've already heard some of my titles. Um, I also serve as a psychiatric expert in litigation related to systems, as well as competence to stand trial issues, including in, in the state of Washington where I'm a psychiatric expert in the true blood matter for the court monitor. I'm also a consultant to other jurisdictions, organizations, and federal entities. And so because I do all of this other work in policy and practice, I want people to realize that the opinions expressed in this talk are mine and not of other persons or entities for whom I um, uh, consult. We're gonna go over a few things today. I'm gonna assume that in this audience, we have some people that are well familiar with the competence to stand trial system, but there may be others that are less familiar. So I'm gonna describe basic elements of the system and the pathways that people take. I'm gonna describe how the sequential intercept model can be adapted to divert individuals from the criminal legal system as well as the competency system, which is part of that legal system. And I'm gonna discuss the pros and cons of civil commitment as an alternative strategy for individuals at risk of being subsumed in or returning to the criminal competency system. So let me start with my first learning objective for you all, which is to describe the basic elements of the competence to stand trial system and pathways that people take when they enter into it. So what is competence to stand trial? 
Competence to stand trial is a constitutional right that individuals have based on the 6th and 14th Amendment. When a criminal defendant is charged with a crime, our laws require that they be capable of standing trial to ensure the fairness, dignity, and accuracy of the trial proceedings. That means if they have a serious mental illness or an intellectual disability that impedes their ability to serve as a trial defendant, the trial has to pause and pay attention to that issue until they can be restored to competence to stand trial and then proceed as any other defendant would. But it gets more complicated than that. In, the, in, in 1960, there was a landmark legal case called Dusky versus the United States, which defined what it means to be competent to stand trial. And the standard has been adopted throughout the United States in, in jurisdictions in, in every state and territory that um, holds to this, um, these provisions within the United States. And the standard is that whether the def the, a defendant is competent if they have sufficient present ability to consult with his lawyer, his or her lawyer, with a reasonable degree of rational understanding and a rational as well as factual understanding of the proceedings against him or her or them. Uh, the, the case was written in 1960, so it's written in the male form, but it really applies to any, any gender. And the idea is that it is a present ability, meaning it's at the time that they are gonna be serving as a pretrial defendant and that they have to have the ability to consult with their lawyer with a reasonable degree of rational understanding, not a perfect degree, but also have a rational as well as factual understanding of the proceedings against them. This standards allows professionals, mental health professionals, to look at the clinical data and translate the clinical data into this legal standard and render opinions to the court where the court makes adjudications as to whether the defendant is or is not competent to stand trial. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. The first um, thing to realize though, is that as we look at this dusky standard, we are really looking at breaking down a defendant's abilities into, into various parts. Subsumed in that standard is whether the defendant can understand the charges, the verdicts and potential consequences, whether they can understand the trial participants and process, do they really know what the judge, what the, who the judge is in terms of what their role is, the attorneys, the prosecution, the defense, uh, or are they delusional about any of those uh, individuals? What is their ability to assist their counsel in helping their counsel defend themselves? And what is their decision-making ability? Is it impeded by mental illness? or a lack of ability to reason through decisions that they may have to make because defendants have to make any number of decisions along the way. For example, they have to decide whether to testify or not. They have to decide whether to enter a plea bargain or not, if one is being offered. They may have to decide between uh, whether to have a jury trial or a, a bench trial where a judge makes the decision. And many, many other decisions, um, looking at evidence, helping weigh the evidence, helping develop a strategy, these are the things that a trial defendant has to do. And so these are the basic elements that a forensic evaluator would be looking at in making that determination. So what does the forensic process look like? So first of all, we have to follow what is happening to the human beings that are going through the competency system. And it's always really important to remember that these are humans whose lives are touched by the criminal system, uh, sometimes in a way that, as we'll talk about later, may not be the right path for them from a societal perspective. But nonetheless, when we look just at the straight pathway of the competency process, it always starts with an arrest. You don't get into the competence to stand trial system without being arrested and charged with a crime. So it's a criminal matter. The competency issue is so important, again, grounded in constitutional rights, that there is case law that states that any party whether it's prosecution, defense, or even the judge, if they have a doubt about the defendant's competency must raise the issue and call the question so that the trial doesn't proceed with an incompetent defendant. Then there's going to be an evaluation. Now, this way that these evaluation work, the, the evaluation process works um, varies across jurisdictions. If you look around the United States, there's a whole host of ways that this could happen. Uh, many states have certified examiners or qualified examiners. Uh, there may be one examiner. Some states require more than one examiner. 
also there may be a court ordered examiner, but that the defense or the prosecution may also contest that examination, those findings, and there may be outside experts that get hired to render opinions related to the competence to stand trial issue. But there will be some version of an evaluation that takes place with some type of examiner, again, depending on the jurisdiction, the qualifications and training of that examiner may vary. And then there will be an opinion rendered and the court will make some findings. The court, meaning the judge, will determine, is this defendant competent to stand trial? In which case, as one of my judge friends says, they return to the trial highway and they proceed just like any other defendant. On the other hand, they could be uh, determined incompetent to stand trial, but restorable. Often there's a clinical opinion about whether the nature of their condition is such and that whether the statutory time frame is such that the defendant could be restored to competence within the statutorily defined time frame, or they could be adjudicated incompetent and unrestorable. And unrestorable does not mean hopeless or untreatable in a broad sense. It simply means that they would not be able to be restored to competence to stand trial in the legally authorized time frame for those jurisdictions that have a time frame. So for example, in Michigan, our maximum time frame for restoration is 15 months. Our minimum time frame could be potentially 60 days. And so one of the questions is, can this person get well enough to be competent to stand trial within the time frame that's allowed? Disposition is then another matter that's going to be decided. So for example, if a defendant is found incompetent but restorable, then they may be ordered for treatment or treatment for restoration purposes. Um, they may be, uh, they may be uh, sent, uh, they may be instead, for example, if they're found incompetent and unrestorable, they may be uh, sent for um, what sometimes is called a civil flip or a probate commitment. Sorry, that's a typo, that should say probate commitment uh, through a different type of court process where they're then civilly committed uh, on other grounds un unrelated to the competency process. Now, it's obviously more complicated than that, and I'm gonna get into this a little bit more as I go, but that's the basic contours of what happens. The next thing is that um, to realize is that there's multiple reasons why a defendant may be incompetent to stand trial, and they may have single conditions or co-occurring or multiply occurring disorders that contribute to their, their um, mental state at the time that they are presenting as a criminal defendant. They could have serious mental illness, they could have substance use disorders, they could have intellectual and or develop other developmental disabilities, they could have medical conditions, they often have trauma histories, they may have complex personality issues, but not all do. And really we know um, from a lot of research on this that most people are found incompetent to stand trial due to psychotic and affect disor affective disorders like bipolar disorder. Uh, and many, but not the majority, are found incompetent to stand trial related to intellectual develop or, or other developmental disabilities or traumatic brain injury, or even a new group that's being paid more attention to recently through some other work, individuals with neurocognitive conditions. So they may be a smaller percentage of the individuals represented, uh, but these are the reasons why people are found incompetent to stand trial in large part. And so we know that the bulk of the reasons are psychotic disorders and affective disorders, and those are highly treatable conditions with proper medications and other interventions. The population that goes into the competency system is what I've often referred to in my writings as the crossover population, because what happens is they have care, they have treatment needs, and their care is delivered across settings, community settings, forensic hospitals, and correctional settings. And they move in and out of these set settings, crossing over. And one of the challenges that we see in the competency system is that they have disrupted care episodes where they may be started on a medication in one setting, the medication may be stopped or changed or unavailable in another setting. And the person in involved in the system is therefore caught between these different systems, different ways people are looking at them clinically, and they, they lose that opportunity for continuity of care if we look at it just from a public health or a medical perspective. And I often think about this as I think about diabetes. If somebody has diabetes and they need insulin, you wouldn't want the insulin to be stopped based on where they are 
in a criminal process, you would want the insulin to be able to be continued. But unfortunately, what we see in these um, forensic systems and in the competency process is because of a number of factors that play into this, people's treatment episodes get disrupted and shift, and they may look different in different settings. The competence to stand trial evaluation includes this development of an opinion that the forensic evaluator is required to make, which requires a nexus between the mental health finding and the legal definition of competence to stand trial. And they recommend dispositions such as the chance of restorability. This is a complicated area of clinical work. So we're not just saying that Joe Smith, the defendant, has schizophrenia or has schizoaffective disorder. We have to say why Joe Smith's schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder creates symptoms, for example, delusions or mood instability and irritability such that they think that their attorney is out to get them or part of a conspiracy uh, system that they have a delusional belief about. And they're so irritable that they can't sit with their attorney without becoming perhaps behaviorally dysregulated. And so the evaluator has to link the symptoms to the competence standard, that dusky standard, and then recommend whether this person can be restorable or not restorable, which again, really only relates to can that defendant, Joe Smith, be restored within the statutorily authorized timeframe uh, to competence to stand trial. Again, there are many state differences. So you, it's, there's a lot of people that want to do research in this space and talk about their data um, and, and make broad generalizations. But one of the challenges, we're talking about criminal law that has evolved over many decades. And every state has statutes or case law that and, and, and practices and systems that look at things differently. I've had the fortune to work in many, many states um, looking at these issues. And there's lots of different mechanics. Um, the evaluations can be done through state operated evaluators or state, state employee evaluators, or they can be contracted out. Again, some states have single evaluators and some states have multiple evaluators required by law. Many different disciplines across the United States have been authorized to do these evaluations. In some states, it's just psychiatrists. In others, it's psychologists or psychiatrists. In some states, social workers are also allowed to do these evaluations. The standards are also different. In some states, you can do same day evaluations if you have court clinics right there to do screening. Uh, we used to do those in Massachusetts. In other states, you're required to do the evaluation within a period of days, five days, 60 days. The days, and many states have tried to adopt laws or have laws that have a certain time frame required. And I would say each system is built around some of, the, some of the ways the laws have been defined. Also, there could be evaluations done in different locations. Sometimes the evaluations are done in jails for defendants that are held on bail. Sometimes they're done in the community. Sometimes evaluations are done in state hospitals, um, or they can be done literally at the courthouse, as I said we did in, in um, Massachusetts. Then we get to the restoration phase for those defendants that are found incompetent to stand trial and restorable. Now, the word restoration is the broad term that's utilized. However, there are sensitivities to that term for individuals that are, have intellectual disabilities. Some people would say we should refer to that term as attainment or remediation. Uh, some people would say habilitation, although that's uh, more complicated because it involves other types of habilitation services. But the reason why the wording is different is because some would say that individuals that are, have intellectual disability may never have been competent in the first place. They don't have a condition that's sudden and acute and, and will be restored when they're medicated. They may have a long lasting condition. And so they're, we're really working to have them attain competence to stand trial. Nonetheless, because most people are found incompetent to stand trial due to psychosis and affective disorders, the mainstay of competence restoration is really psychotropic medications. Um, we know that medications can help people uh, quell delusions, quell affective instability. Um, there's been a lot of case law looking at medications and who can order those medications and under what conditions those medications uh, can be ordered and what legal risks if people are on medications get presented if a pretrial defendant now is on medications that makes them have mask faces and, and, and maybe not as responsive and maybe not look as... as uh, concerned or, or um, uh, empathic to the victim's plight. There's been case law that's looked at these issues about whether medications can legally jeopardize a defendant's chances of, of being seen fairly. 
I would argue that a person with mental illness, there may be a lot of stigma that's going on in that court case to begin with. Um, the medications may raise part of that, but there's a whole host of other things that may, may be happening for that defendant. And so the issues of medications have been uh, thought about a lot. There's a case, a US Supreme Court case called Cell, Cell versus the United States, which allowed for involuntary administration of medication solely to restore competence to stand trial as long as other things have been, uh, uh, the other means of looking at medications have been attempted and other factors are in play. And I'm not gonna get into a lot of details about that because I really wanna talk about the larger systems issues. The other piece of competence restoration that really blossomed, I would say in the, maybe in the 90s, um, in the, yeah, the 90s was the, when, when we saw a lot of this literature come out were the non-pharmacologic interventions that included classroom work, included mock trial, included group therapies that really worked to educate defendants about how courtrooms work uh, to restore them to competence to stand trial. And state hospitals became the place where this was occurring, where defendants would spend hours a day in classrooms learning about uh, criminal legal processes. And although, of course, I think all defendants probably could benefit from some education about criminal legal processes, those defendants that were found incompetent to stand trial because the order was specific to restoration, um, that became part of the treatment that was offered in, the, in those settings. There was a case in 1972 uh, called Jackson versus Indiana, in which an individual with in, uh, in, uh, intellectual disability who was also deaf and mute was sent for commitment for restoration until he was deemed, quote, sane, which really the court meant until he could be restored, which meant that he was kind of stuck because the clinical data was that he was not gonna be able to be restored. And so there were legal arguments made that, his, uh, uh, that the ease in which he was sent to the place of confinement was low, but the burden to get him out was high. And um, this raised other constitutional uh, equal protection and cruel and unusual punishment uh, grounds. And the Supreme Court basically said due process requires that the nature and duration of confinement should bear some reasonable relation to the purpose for which the individual is confined. And so therefore, if you get to the point where the defendant is not going to be able to be restored to competency, if you still think they need to be confined, you have to find alternative grounds to do that. And that generally would include civil commitment as that alternative grounds. But then again, as I'll talk about later, they need to meet civil commitment criteria, which are different because the only criteria for confinement for somebody in the competency system is that they are incompetent to stand trial. But they may not have a mental illness. They may not be a danger to themselves or others. Those are not the criteria for competence, uh, re for competence restoration, whereas those are typically the criteria for civil commitment. Restoration also looks very different across states. I practiced in the state of Massachusetts where restoration was not even mentioned in the statute. That's rare. I think Massachusetts may be the only state that doesn't have restoration in its statute, but the locations vary. And we're seeing um, mostly this occurs in state hospitals, although the trends are shifting. I'll talk more about that. Some states had started jail restoration, uh, but more and more we're seeing states start outpatient restoration Again, the time for restoration is usually defined by statute. In some cases, despite Jackson versus Indiana, the states don't have clear definitions. So that's competency and the competency pathway. Now let me talk a little bit about the sequential intercept model and how that can be adapted to divert individuals from the competency system. Well, why do we wanna divert individuals from the competency system if competence to stand trial is grounded in constitutional rights? Well, it's incredibly important that any defendant facing a criminal charge, if they're going to go to trial, be competent to stand trial. However, what we're seeing is more and more across the United States, individuals who are charged with even low level offenses who may never go to trial are waiting to get into hospital beds for restoration services. And you can see on any given day, um, uh, headline news about bed shortages, leaving people with mental illness, waiting for uh, restoration beds, but waiting in jails, which is partly why jail restoration was seen as, a, as, a, as an opportunity to begin that restoration work before, uh, while waiting for a hospital bed. We'll talk a little bit about that. It's a bit um, controversial, I would say, 
in terms of, of where that's, you know, what that actually means. Um, uh, so anyway, we're, well, this is the issue. So we're now facing this challenge where we have this constitutional right to be competent, but now we've got these other grounds that are, are uh, highly problematic that the system isn't able to keep up with the demand. And the numbers of evaluations that are being requested are increasing. And you can, you across the country. And that, I think we could talk a lot about why we're seeing increased numbers of evaluations being requested. But you can see from this data that looks back at 2016, this is data from uh, the Nashville Research Institute that shows, shows you just across the board, how many states, the duration of time forensic patients are in state hospital wait lists to get in for incompetency uh, uh, to, to, have, uh, to move through the competency system. And suffice it to say, the wait lists are long. Now, COVID has shifted. For some states, wait lists have gone down. In other states, wait lists have gone up. This shows you, too, that the percentage of individuals occupying a bed within state hospitals, if you just look to the right, since it's kind of a hard slide to read, um, on average, the percentage of beds um, that are occupied in state hospitals for defendants being sent for restoration has really increased over the last um, 20 years. And again, there are many reasons that people have hypothesized for why that is, um, but nonetheless, that is the case. And it's not solely accounted for um, for bed closures um, uh, because the nature of the pop, but, but many other factors play into that. The process for competency um, can be put on a map. This is sort of a, um, a depiction, a loose depiction of what I've already described in words. And there's a lot that goes into each of these points and decisions. And as we've been thinking about this, and my colleagues and I across the country have been looking at these issues, um, there's a number of decision points that happen. And unfortunately, what happens for defendants all too often is they go in for restoration, they're restored to competence, they go back to court, they're adjudicated as restored, they return to jail, where they then, as I said earlier, may be off their medication, not taking the same medication, not being prescribed the same medication, they decompensate, they come back to court, they look incompetent again, and they start all over. I've sort of referred to this in some ways because I think people can relate to this dynamic as a shoots and ladders dynamic, um, which is not, a, not to make light of it because it's not a game, but it is that concept of you're getting close to being restored or being out of your legal process, and then you kind of start all over again because of the nature of your illness. And obviously that's not what we want for humans going through um, who have these kinds of conditions. And so many people across the board in a bipartisan way have really started to look at these issues. Um, the problem is once the competency issue is raised, the forensic route is in play. There's nothing else you can do because of the constitutional importance of competence to stand trial. And so what's happened is people get get routed into the forensic system, and then, then other opportunities that might be available for defendants that aren't incompetent to stand trial have potential for diversion because there's a lot going on with jail diversion and mental health courts and all sorts of things that are out there. But because the forensic ball is in play, people sort of think that the issue is taken care of and that's the only option for them. And all parties justifiably and frankly legally turn the matter over to another entity and then the solutions become complicated. Um, and so this is some of the things that we're seeing um, about once the issue of incompetence is raised, which again, statutorily and from a case law perspective, it's important to raise that. Um, there's lots of issues that contribute to the current system. Um, there's challenges, environmental factors that can lead to destabilization, both in community settings as well as in jail settings, uh, and frankly, even in state hospital settings, utilization management is not really looked at in terms of bed days or numbers, except for, I would say, in those cases where there's been litigation that people have paid more attention to it, or states um, that have uh, gotten ahead of the litigation and tried to do more utilization management themselves. Um, Inter-evaluator reliability, where you get different opinions about people's restor restorability or what they look like from a competence uh, standpoint. There's multiple potential for re-evaluations of competence to stand trial. And so you get a lot of complexity, a lot of players in the system that, that play a role. Um, one of the compelling studies that I, I highlight very often was a study looking back at 2010 out of Arizona, which looked at 293 admissions of unrestorable defendants who were matched 
with civil admissions. And they were matched for a lot of the same clinical factors. And what they saw was that for the unrestorable patients, even though they met fewer criteria for hospital admission, and uh, they received, even though they met fewer admissions criteria, meaning if they went the civil route, they might not have been admitted, they received more court ordered medication and they had longer hospital stays despite being found less dangerous to themselves or others than the community sample. And what this study really says is that once you get that forensic label, that incompetent to stand trial label, you're at risk for being institutionalized for a lot longer than if you didn't have that label. We also uh, don't have a ton of literature, but we, we are looking at this more and more as defendants with intellectual and developmental disabilities, traumatic brain injuries, and the neurocognitive conditions in terms of what this looks like. I can think of countless cases that I've sadly consulted on that um, where um, older adults get arrested for disinhibited behavior related to their neurocognitive decline, and they end up in the forensic system with no possibility of restoration and very difficult issues because they don't meet commitment criteria. So we need to look at new paradigms, moving people from institutions to community-based settings and according with, to the Americans with Disabilities Act and really look at what, what's possible. Now, I'm not the only one talking about this. The American Bar Association developed updated standards in 2006 where they actually gave some permission that said to the attorneys, you know, if you can find alternatives to hospitalization, you should offer those for some incompetent defendants because oftentimes defense attorneys don't want to be sort of blamed for what they would consider uh, ineffective assistance of counsel, which is sort of the attorney equivalent of malpractice. Um, if they're not raising the competency question, which requires the, the, those constitutional standards, these ABA um, standards really did, I think, allow some permissiveness for diversion opportunities to be considered, especially if there's low level uh, charges where um, trial is not really the ultimate goal here. Now, systems, including in Washington, have tried to develop outpatient competency restoration as an alternative to hospitalization. This is somewhat old data, but it's available now in approximately 18 states, even though statutes probably allow it in 35 states. Um, within states, there may be county variation and, um, and uh, of availability, and there may be variation on design. As I said, some states have start, had started to develop in, in uh, jail-based restoration programs. Um, these are, again, I think are really complicated and, and have some ethically fraught issues um, because you're doing essentially saying you're gonna do restoration in what's a, a jail setting, which is inherently not a therapeutic setting. Um, there's gonna be need for separations of roles as there are in, in any setting, treaters and forensic evaluators. If people need involuntary medication, Jail's not the, really the place for that. In fact, in most states where there is jail restoration, if people are not voluntarily taking medication, they still are on wait lists to get into state hospitals. Um, the jail services are complicated and we can talk a lot about that. And costs, if you really look at the state level of costs, what you're purchasing may be, um, it, it's complicated in terms of what you're purchasing and how that plays and whether that really saves money in the long run if you're really looking at cost factors. So it really begs the question about diversion. Why would some of our sickest people who are in the criminal legal system, you could argue these are some of our most impaired individuals, not be eligible for jail diversion um, opportunities that have become so popular in a, for other individuals? So is diversion and going upstream an option? Yes, but it's not fully realized. There's a lot of potential. For example, across the country, again, including in Washington, people are looking at individuals charged with misdemeanors. Why should they be in this competency trap? Aren't, couldn't they be diverted into a community setting? And are there opportunities for community release and other diversion strategies? Well, back in 2017, when I came to Michigan, we hosted what we called a multi-state peer learning collaborative. We invited our neighboring states and everybody came together to talk about um, how competence to stand trial was working in our states. And from that learning collaborative, we really developed some strategies. Every state came up with some strategies that they implemented following the learning collaborative, including statutory change, data collection, policy, and practice that we could all implement from um, the experience of the other states. Even though each of our laws were quite different, um, we, we really learned from that. And the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration picked up on that idea 
through their gain center, which is their kind of criminal justice technical assistance arm. And I've had the uh, opportunity to be one of the lead subject matter experts in their communities of practice, which started in 2018. Um, and uh, now um, we're still doing another community of practice. Um, even to this day, you can see um, how many uh, we've added Alabama to the mix. Um, but the states in blue are the ones that are currently participating in the communities of practice, where we're really looking to expand um, expand the knowledge through other states' experience. Um, I'm sorry, it's it's uh, the the total the sum total are the states that are participating. It's the green ones that are are no longer participating. So the orange, purple, and blue are the ones if you if you can see colors, um, but you. Uh, for this. Um, so we have a lot of states that are trying to look at this and trying to solve the, um, the issues of competence to stand trial. And one of the things that we're really focusing on is the sequential intercept model. The sequential intercept model was a model that was uh, originally um, promulgated in 2006 through a paper that was written in psychiatric services by Mark Munitz, a community psychiatrist, and Patty Griffin, a systems forensic psychologist, who partnered together and said, listen, the criminal legal system happens in a logical way. If we take sort of a public health framework and we say, look, there's too many people with mental illness in the criminal system, we need to route them out. How do we do that? Well, we have to first identify who they are, and then we have to develop uh, pathways for them to get out of the criminal system and back into the community system. Um, and uh, in 2017, the sequential intercept model was further um, modified to include intercept zero. So essentially looking at community crisis services, law enforcement, uh, uh, where law enforcement comes into play, are there opportunities to divert people from the criminal system through law enforcement, uh, intercept two, initial detention and court hearings, intercept three, jails and courts, intercept four, re-entry when people are leaving jails um, for the competency population, or prison may not be as relevant because we're still talking about pretrial defendants. And then intercept five is people on community supervision who are being violated often on technical violations and returning into the carceral settings. And so the broad framework of the sequential intercept model is use a, use a pathway approach to identify strategies to divert people or provide them with alternatives to incarceration all along the pathways, recognizing that some people would continue to move through the criminal legal system, but there's opportunities to continually look at what can be put in place to support their success in alternative settings so that the criminal setting becomes less and less the mental health treatment setting, um, the de facto mental health treatment setting, and that we move people into treatment context. Now, although this started as a, a model for mental illness, for dealing with people with often serious mental illness, it has expanded to people with co-occurring disorders and substance use disorders, and now intellectual and developmental disabilities. And it's really a great framework. And when I started working in state government, um, even my budget director said, you know, you need a strategy for how you're gonna work and run forensic services. And the strategy that really we came up with was using the sequential intercept model to try and advocate for funding and policy and practice at each of the intercept points to improve upon the opportunity to move people out of the criminal system and into treatment services. And, and this sequential intercept model actually was adopted in federal statute in the, in the Cures Act, which was the final bill that uh, President Obama signed, in which it said that um, this is a model that needs to be utilized and it sort of put in place the opportunity for federal grant funding to utilize the sequential intercept model and for communities to talk about where they're at in the sequential intercept model in terms of what they are proposing to have funded. And so it's become quite popular. What we have done since then, my colleague Lisa Callahan and I, um, who've written on this issue and have been working on these communities of practice together with SAMHSA, is we ad adopted and adapted the sequential intercept model um, uh, and looked at the competence to stand trial system in the same vein. And it's really at that intercept two and three, because remember anyone in the competence to stand trial system is a pretrial defendant. And what we said is, what can we do to break down all the processes that happen in that competence to stand trial system 
and consider alternatives to reroute people out and divert them out into better uh, services in the community where they're attached to get their needs met, whatever those needs might be. So is that when the competency question is raised, is there a way before it's raised to divert them out? During the evaluation process, can evaluators render opinions that help people move to outpatient type settings? Um, even for restoration, can it be done in less restrictive settings? Um, and uh, even for those individuals that are sent for restoration and then sent to hospitals or to alternative sites, is there a way for them to be attached to individuals' supports that will help them and keep them from returning into the criminal legal system? Um, we also came, uh, we wrote a paper that was published in Psychiatric Services in 2020 that really uh, delineated all of this. Uh, for example, looking at um, better strategies with crisis response and police, Again, first court appearances, training of forensic evaluators on alternatives, because I can tell you when I worked in one system I, where I did forensic evaluations, we had a tagline that said, this person is incompetent. And in my opinion, they are restorable and therefore they need to go to the state hospital as the less, least restrictive alternative available to them for restoration. And that was because back in the day, 20 years ago, or maybe, maybe that was 10 years ago, the hospital was the only alternative. So of course it was the least restrictive alternative. So now we have to train forensic evaluators to think about what are less restrictive alternatives. Pathways to acute psychiatric units, for example, if somebody's acutely psychiatrically ill, why are they not getting admitted to acute psychiatric units as opposed to only restoration programs and other ideas that came forward. Some states have adopted competence to stand trial dockets where judges consolidate all the competency cases, um, re-examination of restorability predictions, and then looking at intercept four and five around re-entry services, linkage and wraparound supports, as well as aftercare supports. And a lot of this plays uh, into Another paper that I had the privilege of writing with my colleague, Doris Fuller, um, for NASHBIT and, and the Treatment Advocacy Center, which uh, came together uh, in an unusual partnership, um, really talking about this idea of the vital role of the full continuum of psychiatric care. And individuals in the competency system similarly need that full continuum of care. Some may benefit from out and may only need outpatient services, but some may need other types of services, whether it's crisis services, whether it's residential services, whether it's inpatient acute or state hospital services. So we really need to think about not only the criminal issue that's going on, but what's the clinical issue and what are the needs of this individual? Are there solutions in the community? Does Where does Medicaid play a role? Because many of these people are uh, on uh, public benefits. And what about the Olmstead issues in terms of getting people in the community setting since they are individuals who would qualify under the ADA? And is ADA, the ADA the change catalyst that will help this? And finally, my last learning objective was to have you be able to, at the end of this presentation, discuss the pros and cons of civil commitment as an alternative strategy for individuals at risk of being subsumed in or returning to the criminal competency system. Now, many people are talking about civil commitment, in particular outpatient commitment, as the single solution. And I would argue that if you ever hear anything as a single solution to the mental health system, you're probably talking to somebody that is a little bit um, new to the game, let's just say, because there is no single solution. These are complex issues and um, the solutions are equally um, complicated and need to be multidisciplinary and focused so that everybody's talking the same language to the extent that they can. What is civil commitment? It is a civil non-criminal legal mechanism through which the government mandates certain aspects of an individual's life because they, traditionally because the individual has a mental illness. Now I know there's civil commitment for sex, people with problematic sexual behaviors and there's some states have civil commitment for substance use disorders, but for these purposes, I'm focusing on those with mental illness. The goals are generally related to preventing harm and uh, providing care and the government intrusion on liberty is justified by parents patriae, the government as parent, and the police powers of trying to prevent harm from occurring. And we are pretty familiar with civil commitment for inpatient services, that involuntary commitment. Um, and what that requires is that there be a defined target population. You can't just go around and civilly commit everybody that you're worried about. There has to be a defined target population. Usually the definition for mental illness is gonna be defined in either administrative rules or state law. 
Um, there's going to have to be procedure and due process to be fair to people so we don't violate other constitutional rights of individuals. And then there's going to be provisions of what the court order allows or doesn't allow. And states usually have relied upon civil commitment for inpatient processes, and more and more states are looking at outpatient civil commitment as a potential remedy. Again, we think about civil commitment in different realms. Persons with IDD are not generally included in these, although there is a case called Heller versus Doe in which the Supreme Court said that uh, states can have, at least the Kentucky statute was not struck down when it had different provisions for people with IDD who were uh, civilly committed. But we're talking again for the purposes of this, the bulk of individuals who are in the competency system who have serious mental illness. So the mental disorder has to be defined and linked to some type of risk, usually harm to self, harm to others, or maybe grave disability or inability to care for self. Some states have expanded their civil commitment criteria to a need for treatment standard. There's a lot of discussion now about whether there should also be a capacity standard inability to make informed treatment decisions. That's, I think, uh, the direction some states are trying to go in. Whether that's good or not good, I'm not going to say. I, don't, I, I think that you all will have to have your own opinions about that. Um, historically, outpatient commitment has included conditional release from a hospital where you have people who are hospitalized and they're sort of on a tether to the hospital with conditions, um, an alternative to hospitalization where people meet the same criteria as inpatient commitment, but the court order allows for an outpatient option. 33 states have that, and some would consider that a least restrictive alternative to inpatient commitment. Um, and then there's other states that have adopted this preventive outpatient commitment where if there's no relation to the hospital, you can have assist what they call, many states call assisted outpatient treatment alone under a court order. Again, some people think that that's a remedy so that anyone in the competency system could be shifted to an AOT or an outpatient commitment order, but that becomes complicated. Usually the court order requires compliance with conditions and we can't forget that commitment itself is a liberty depriving action. There's a justification for it, but you wanna narrowly tailor the group that would be uh, appropriate for something like that. And you wanna look at what does this court order order actually? Most of the time the statutes include that the courts can order compliance with conditions. That includes case management, housing, medications. Although interestingly enough, and we just had this discussion in Michigan around with some of my colleague uh, community mental health medical directors, the court order may order medications, but it may not authorize and usually does not authorize involuntary administration of medication, meaning it may say to the respondent, you must take medications. But if the respondent doesn't want to you know, take the medicines, it doesn't allow the hands on. That's a whole nother uh, issue that has to be sorted out depending on how the state deals with involuntary administration of medications. Non-compliance it is a civil, the, the civil commitment is a civil uh, process. So non-compliance with the court order is not supposed to be sanctioned in a criminal way. It's not supposed to, there isn't jail that comes with it. So non-compliance, you're not complying with the civil court order. Usually what that means is that you would be ordered to be picked up for reevaluation and possibly ordered into the hospital. And so, um, there's not, um, there's not uh, a criminal remedy to this uh, issue because it's a civil process, which I think is, is obviously, you know, it's a civil issue, so that's appropriate. You don't want to have a criminal sanction associated with that. Um, there was uh, research from mostly out of New York, um, Dr. Marvin Swartz led some of that research, that found with New York's law, their AOT, their Assisted Outpatient Program, improved a range of important outcomes for recipients increased services available under the AOT, improved their outcomes. And the finding was after lots of exhaustive research, the court order and its monitoring appeared to offer additional benefits in improving outcomes. And that order itself was found to exert a critical effect on service providers. Now there's people that would raise a lot of criticisms of the research and would say, well, that only worked in New York because it came with a lot of money and funding and services. Um, some of that has been sorted out with some of the data analyses to show that for certain individuals that court order did ex ex exert an effect. And because of the research that came out, many groups took positions um, in favor of AOT, which I think 
in part started the national conversation of AOT, SAMHSA adopting AOT grants, um, and a lot of people looking at AOT as a mechanism. The thing though to realize is New York's law is New York's law. It's not the same as, um, as it is in other laws. And there are still controversies related to um, having a court ordered care. Proponents that take a treatment or oriented focus will say, well, this is better than sending people to hospital. It's better than having them at risk of you know, reoffending where they go to the criminal system if it's related to their illness. Um, opponents would say, but now you have a court order and nobody's minding the store. You've got rights um, that aren't, aren't really being attended to. And that's one of the risks of this type of uh, intervention. And I think you know, we're gonna see how this unfolds over time. And so when we look at competency um, restoration, I think it's just really important for people to realize that these are not the same things and they're not, it, it is somewhat of a square peg in a round hole issue. First of all, you have different jurisdictions. Now there are states that are looking at having the criminal court be able to make civil commitment orders. That's interesting. And I think again, remains to be seen how that plays out. But for the most part, different courts manage these different processes. The purpose in civil commitment is to have general treatment. Whereas the purpose for competency restoration is restoration of competence to stand trial. The duration, is usually six months to a year. In competency restoration, the duration is usually tied to the nature of the criminal offense and how long the criminal court will wait for that restoration determination to be made. Again, the criteria for civil commitment is usually mental illness and risk related to the mental illness, whereas the criteria for competency restoration is tied to the capacity of that individual to serve as a pretrial defendant. The issue of medication non-adherence follows civil rules in civil commitment processes. Whereas in competency restoration, there's gonna be some criminal court rules. Many states have adopted the cell ruling, which um, provides for medication over objection in a hospital setting. Whether this would work, how this would work in an outpatient setting, my um, understanding of the landscape right now is if people are non-adherent in an outpatient setting in, in um, both outpatient restoration and an outpatient civil commitment is it brings people back into the hospital and that would probably be the remedy. So does civil commitment assist in the current, could it be an alternative? Could it be one of those diversion pathways? Well, it might be because for some cases, for example, prosecution may, be feel, may feel more comfortable if an individual is court ordered to comply with treatment in the community, they may be more comfortable with letting go of the criminal charges. So it could potentially be a diversion strategy. Um, it does access the usual treatment system, but it also, um, as it uh, evolves, sometimes comes with additional supports because you've got the treatment system now paying attention to that order. There are no sanctions, which is, makes it different than the criminal process. So from a, from a, person-centered perspective, the non-sanction is actually a pro. Um, and there are some positive research findings, at least in some jurisdictions. The cons are, and maybe they're not cons, maybe they're, they're things that still need to be sorted out, is how does the applicability from one legal standard to another um, work? I think there's a lot of confusion about that, at least from the conversations I've been in. Um, this is not just, you know, um, it, you know, one standard for one for all populations. I think we really have to look at this issue that people in the competency system may not neatly fit into the civil commitment system. For example, those with intellectual disabilities, those with autism spectrum disorders, those with traumatic brain injuries, those with neurocognitive con conditions, which are specifically often excluded from civil commitment. And frankly, not people that you would wanna bring back into a, for example, a state hospital because the state hospital isn't the place where they're gonna get modern scientifically advanced treatments for those kinds of conditions uh, or supports. And courts may be reluctant to dismiss charges in the community. So you have this whole thing of the criminal charge potentially still hanging over people's heads. Um, and how is that, is that right? when individuals who aren't incompetent to strand trial may not have those charges hanging over their heads if they're eligible for diversion. 
and civil commitment research may not apply to states with different laws and different services. And so we have to be careful about how each state applies it. So what are the considerations for moving forward? Civil commitment may be a diversion strategy to move some cases from criminal process to uh, civil. Um, there may be an overreach of mandated care. We have to think about non-adherence to treatment. We have to think about, it may be considered one tool in a toolbox rather than a total solution. So in summary, competence to stand trial grounded in fundamental constitutional rights. The current system is overwhelmed and other rights are being compromised that we have to address. And the balance and thought that, a, in, that is person-centered and focused on accessing treatment when needed are really must be part of the policy strategies and solutions. And with that, I think I will stop. Uh, I know I've taken up a lot of time. I hope we have time for maybe one or two questions. I don't know. There's time for one or two questions. One came in already. I'd encourage participants to, to write in a question. But thank you for this presentation. Uh, um, I hesitated to interrupt at the end. Uh, it's so informative and covered um, many, many complicated topics. I wanted to notify uh, audience members that the uh, um, papers uh, that Dr. Pinels mentioned in psychiatric services uh, actually were awarded, uh, well, the authors of the papers uh, were awarded the Guttmacher Award uh, by the American Psychiatric Association uh, in 2020 for outstanding contributions to the literature. And I'd encourage audience members to, to read those uh, as follow-up from today's presentation. Uh, one question came in um, regarding racial differences in the competency process. If, if there's differences in who gets referred for competency evaluations, lack of competence, will you comment on that? Yeah, sure. Well, actually I studied that. There's a paper that's published in Psychiatric Services that colleagues and I wrote. Um, uh, I don't even remember what year it was. Um, but we know that there's racial and ethnic disparities in the criminal system. We know that there's healthcare disparities. And so it's natural to assume, and we have seen in the literature that there are disparities in who comes into the competency system and also who gets sent to more secure settings. That was one of my, our, our hypotheses when we did the paper looking at Massachusetts data was, and the system was different, but we had the option of sending people to secure settings for um, their evaluations or non -sec less secure settings. And of course, more black and brown people were sent to the more secure settings with a lot of reasons why that is, because you've got criminal, clinical, a lot of factors um, being part of that. And so I know there's at least two jurisdictions that are re-examining their data right now, looking at that again. And I think this is a really important area to continue to explore. Thank you. Uh Anyone who's got a question, uh, please write it into the chat or the Q&A. Dr. Peel, I, I wonder if, if, if you wanted to, to rejoin or make a, make a comment or pose a question. Given that was an absolutely terrific talk. I think if you are an audience member who doesn't have experience in the forensic system, wow, you just learned a lot in how it relates to community psychiatry. Thank you so much, Dr. Pinels. Uh, for any audience member or folks who watch this later, uh, if you're interested in hearing more from Dr. Pinels, I want to remind you that we're having a forensic spotlight with Dr. Pinels on Monday uh, from 4 to 5 p.m. It's geared towards trainees in particular, looking at how Dr. Pinels and others gets into this field, some of the fascinating natures of, about forensic mental health and policy making. Uh, so contact the Center for Mental Health Policy and the Law if you need the link for that. But again, it's Monday from four to five. Well, how great uh, that there's an opportunity for follow-up. I'm really glad, glad to hear about that. Um, well, you know, we're, we're right at one o'clock. And I, I do want to thank you again, Dr. Pinos, uh, for today's presentation, for joining our Grand Round series, and to Dr. Peel uh, for, for um, sponsoring today's presentation through the, uh, through the center. And uh, we'll leave it at that for today. Thank you. Thank you so much again for inviting me. Take care.